Welcome to Games Made Easy. I'm Dan Z. Inspired by the great work of Rodney Smith and Watch It Played, this is my attempt to contribute to the board game community with more instructional videos. I want to start with one of my favorites, the 4X Nation Builder Clash of Cultures Civilizations by Christian Markison and produced by Z-Man Games. This is the expansion to the base game Clash of Cultures. Fans of this game will agree that this expansion is an essential one. I will be teaching the game as if the expansion was just part of the game when released. This will still cover all rules needed to play just the base game. Now, 4X games by nature can get involved. We will cover a lot in this video, but this game is streamlined enough to play in a shorter time frame without losing the epic 4X feel. So, join me at the table, let's open the box, and set up the game. First, take the pile of region tiles and remove the starting ones. These are double-sided, or have the skull and crossbone sticker on the back. Shuffle the remaining regions. Then, refer to page 3 of the rulebook. Dependent on the number of players, lay out the regions in the indicated fashion. Here, I've set up for a two-player game. Each player chooses a color and takes their player board, player aid, cubes, city pieces, and units. All players also take the five resource tokens and both a happiness and culture indicator. The line of numbered compartments across the top of the player board is called the scale. Place the happiness and culture indicators above the scale right here. Place the five resource tokens, food, wood, ore, gold, and ideas in the zero position. Then all players gain their starting two food by moving the food token into the compartment labeled two. As players gain and use resources throughout the game, the resource tokens are moved up and down the scale, signifying the amount the civilization possesses. No civilization may have more than eight of any resource. Players take two advancement cubes and place them in farming and mining the starting two advancements. Shuffle this stack of civilization boards and deal two to each player. Players read over their two civilizations and decide on one to make their own, returning the other to the box. If a player's chosen civilization has a region pictured here, then replace their starting region with the one pictured on the civilization board. Each player looks through the leader deck and removes the three leaders associated with their civilization. These are mixed and placed face down above the civilization board. Flip the top card. This is the player's opening leader. Each player places a settlement, a settler, and their leader in the green fertile space on their starting region. Shuffle the objective and action decks and deal one of each to each player. Shuffle the event and wonder decks and place them near the other. Have the remaining tokens, barbarian and pirate figures, wonder figures, and dice nearby. Place the turn track near the map and place the turn marker on turn 1 of age 1. Randomly determine the first player and give them the first player token. Your game is now set up. In Clash of Cultures, you're trying to be the civilization that makes the most impact to the world, being remembered in the history books. This is done by gaining victory points. Victory points are gained by building up your cities, being culturally rich to influence other cities, conquering other cities forcefully, making them your own, advancing in technologies, building mighty wonders, and completing objectives. Players will accumulate these points over a series of six ages, with three turns in each. On their turn, a player can perform three actions. Let's go over the actions the players may take. One basic action is to advance. This represents your civilization learning a new technology in one of nine advancement categories, or one of three governments. 
players pay two food to advance. Gold, counting as any resource, or ideas, can instead pay the cost. Once paid, place a cube in the desired advancement, following certain criteria. The first advancement in any category must be the topmost advancement. In science, before you can learn astronomy or chemistry, you must first learn mathematics. After the first advancement, the player is free to learn the remaining in any order they choose, unless the skill specifically has a prerequisite. Take, for example, metallurgy. Notice how chemistry is written in red beside it. Chemistry must be learned before you can learn metallurgy. The three categories in gray are government. Players must first learn the skill above the arrow to advance in that particular government. To start a democracy, your civilization must first learn philosophy. As with other advancement categories, the first advancement must be the top one, after which the remaining advancements may be taken in any order. A player may only have one government. If an advancement is learned in a second government, then instead of placing a new cube, all cubes from the first government are placed in the new government, with the top required to go first. Some slots are bordered with yellow or blue. If an advancement with a yellow border is learned, then move your happiness indicator one space and take a mood token from the supply, placing it on your player aid. If an advancement with a blue border is learned, then move your culture indicator one space and take a culture token from the supply and place it on your player aid. These two indicator markers have two effects. First, they represent the maximum number of mood or culture tokens you may have at any one time. So if I gain this culture token, I would not be able to keep it, for I already have the four I'm limited to. However, if I gain a mood token, I can keep it because I only have one and I can have up to three. The second effect the indicator tokens have is to trigger events. When each token reaches the third, fifth, and seventh level, an event card is drawn and resolved. We'll look at these a little later. It's possible that the advancement you've learned on your player board satisfies a special advancement on your civilization board, listed in green. If so, after placing the cube on the player board, place another on the corresponding advancement on your civilization board. Any abilities associated with it are now in effect. You are not required to learn the top special advancement first. You gain these in whatever order you learn their prerequisite advancement on the player board. Another action available to players is to found a city. This can be done when a settler of yours is in a non-barren space void of any other city. Barren spaces are recognized by this tan color. This settler can't found a city because it's in a barren space. This one can't because a city already exists there. If the settler is in an adequate space, simply replace the settler with a settlement city piece. Note that a found city action only acts on one settler. Another found city action will be required to make the second city. Another action is to activate a city. When activated, a city can accomplish one of three things. One is to build units. The maximum number of units allowed to be built is equal to the city's size. City size is determined by the number of city pieces in a city. This city is size 3 and it has the settlement, a market, and a port. This city is only size 2 with just the settlement and a temple. Each unit requires resources. For settlers, two food. For infantry units, one ore and one food. If the city has a port, two wood builds a ship. If the city has a market, elephants can be built for two food, and cavalry can be built for one food and one wood. All units built are placed in the city. Any ships built are placed in the space the port extends into. If any enemy ships happen to be in the space, a battle immediately occurs. More on combat later. Activating a city may instead allow a city to collect resources. 
the number of resources collected is determined by its city size. Cities may receive resources from its space and the six spaces around it, as long as no other cities or enemy units are in those spaces. This city can collect a total of three resources from the space it's in and these four surrounding spaces. This space is blocked by the other city and this one to the enemy units. The type of resource collected is based on the terrain. Fertile spaces give food. Forests give wood. Mountains provide ore. With advancements in irrigation or fishing, barren and sea spaces can provide food. The final option for an activated city is to increase in size. This allows the player to add a city piece to the city. The maximum size the city can be is equal to the number of cities owned by that player. This city is already as large as it can be because it's size 3 and the player has 3 cities. The city pieces available to add is determined by the advancements of the civilization. Learning fishing allows ports. Writing allows the academy. Tactics brings fortresses. Learning myths allows temples. Bartering brings markets. Art and sculptures allow the construction of obelisks and mathematics grants apothecaries. Each city piece grants unique privileges to the city. We'll go over those a little later. The cost is the same for all pieces. One ore and one wood for material and one food for the labor. A city may never have two of the same city piece built in it and if you build a port it must be placed so that it extends into one adjacent sea space as shown here. A player may take the move action. This allows up to three different units or groups to move. To be a group, units must move from the same space to the same space. Moving these two settlers is just one move because they moved as a group. If the settlers move to different spaces, it would be considered two moves. A battle occurs if army units enter a space containing enemy army units or fortresses. More on combat later. When land units or groups move, they move one space. You are allowed to spend additional actions to form another move action to allow units or groups to move additional spaces. However, if ever a unit or group moves into a mountain space or enters battle, they may not be moved for the remainder of this turn. If they enter a forest at any time during their turn, they may still move again, but they may not battle this turn. At no time can there be more than four army units in one space. Settlers and leaders are not counted as army units and thus do not count towards this limit. They also die immediately if attacked by an enemy army without the protection of their own army. If land units enter an unrevealed region, flip the region over, revealing the terrain present. The orientation of this new region is determined by adhering to three simple rules. One. The space in which the land unit enters cannot be a sea space. This settler would have entered a sea space, so the region must be oriented in the opposite way. 2. If it doesn't break rule 1, sea spaces must connect to existing sea spaces. Flipping this region around still allows the settler to enter a land space and places the sea spaces adjacent to each other. If rule 1 and 2 do not apply, then check rule 3. Regions on the edge of the board must have their sea spaces placed to the outside. If the region can be placed either way and still adhere to the three rules, then the player may choose its orientation. After placement, check to see if the new region has a barbarian or pirate symbol. If the barbarian symbol is present, place a barbarian settlement and one barbarian infantry unit on any of the fertile spaces on the region. It may not be on the space the exploring unit has entered. If the pirate symbol is present, place a pirate ship on any empty water space on the region. It cannot be placed in the space with your ship if exploring with a ship. More on barbarians and pirates later. Speaking of ships, Ships are faster and thus their movement works a bit differently. A sea area is formed when multiple sea spaces have been discovered together. 
Ships may move to any space within their sea area as long as they can trace a path to the space and not go through an enemy ship. Entering a space containing enemy ships results in battle. Ships may also carry two land units each. These land units use a move to enter the ships. The second move is used to move the ships across the sea area. The third move cannot be used to disembark the land units because they have already moved during this action. Another move action is required to allow these units to move onto the adjacent land. A ship may be used to explore. If an unexplored region is adjacent to your sea area, move your ship onto the region and reveal it. Once revealed, the region must be oriented to connect sea spaces with the current sea area. If this cannot be done, then the ship returns back to the space it sailed from and the region is placed as normal. Civil improvement is you, as a leader, spending time to make the residents of your cities happy. This is done by spending mood tokens you've collected. A city can be in one of three mood levels. Happy, marked with the yellow smiley face token. Neutral, when no token is present. Or angry marked with the red mean face token. The cost to increase the mood level of a city is equal to the size of the city. Increasing the mood of this size 2 angry city would cost me two mood tokens, bringing it to neutral. If I pay two more, I can increase the mood of the city again from neutral to happy. Still, during the same action, I can spend my one remaining mood token to increase my newly founded city to happy. When you take civil improvement actions, you may act on as many cities as you choose during the same action. The mood of your city affects its productivity. A happy city acts one size larger when he builds units or collects resources. An angry city acts as a size 1 city. This angry size 4 city will only build one unit or collect one resource. Also, angry cities cannot increase in city size. So having an angry size 1 city may still collect and build as normal, but it cannot become a bigger city until made at least neutral. The mood of a city can drop throughout the course of the game. Remember that event cards are drawn and resolved when each indicator reaches the 3rd, 5th, and 7th level. Depending on the event, the mood of your cities may change. The other common way for your cities to drop in mood is by being overworked. This is done when a city is activated more than once in a single turn, in which case it drops one mood level. Take for example this happy size 2 city. Let us use our first action to activate it and build three units. Remember, it can build one extra because it's happy. As our second action, let's activate the city again. This time, we'll collect. Three resources are gained because it's happy. But afterwards, the mood is reduced one level, having been activated twice in the same turn. For the third action, we activate the same city a third time and use the resources to build an academy. After which, the mood drops to angry, for the citizens have been greatly overworked. Angry cities can never be activated more than once, since angry citizens refuse to be overworked. The final action available is cultural influence. This action represents your civilization's customs, language, philosophy, religion, clothing, or architectural design impacting another civilization's city. A cultural influence action targets an enemy non-settlement city piece. The range of the attempt is based on the size of the city used for the action. This size 3 city may influence a city up to three spaces away, so it has enough range for these two cities, both within three spaces. However, this city is only size 1, having only the settlement piece. Settlements can never be targeted. This city has both a fortress and an apothecary to target. A player may choose to spend a culture token to increase the range of the attempt by one. This may be done with multiple tokens, increasing the range by one for each token. 
So this size one city can still influence this city three spaces away, as long as two culture tokens are spent to increase range. Range can never be counted through unrevealed regions. If proper range is earned, a single die is rolled. On a result of a 5 or a 6, the cultural influence attempt is successful. If the roll didn't reach that value, culture tokens may be spent to add 1 to the resulting roll. A success allows you to remove the targeted city piece and replace it with one of yours. Buildings in a city function as normal regardless of their color. However, their victory points are rewarded to the other player. A player may only have one successful influence per turn. However, he may use more than one influence action to gain the one success. You may target city pieces in your own city if they have been influenced to other players. However, while a city is under any foreign influence, it may not conduct a cultural influence attempt itself, meaning that one of your other cities will have to attempt the influence onto this city. During each age, each player will perform three turns within which they perform the three actions. They may choose from any of the six actions we've gone over in any order and quantity they see fit. However, for any player who has learned the trading route advancement, they perform a free action at the start of their turn. Let's look at that now. A player is only eligible for trade routes if they've researched trade routes on their player board. On every turn, before any other action, a player benefits from their trade route. Trade routes are established when settlers or ships are within two spaces of a non-angry enemy city. Each city, settler, and ship can only be involved in one trade route, and only a maximum of four cities can be traded with. Each trade route provides you with one food. Settlers on a ship can be used to establish trade routes independently of the ship they are in. For example, my turn just began, and since I have the trade route advancement, I check trade routes. I see that this settler is within two of this city. This ship with a settler on it is within range of these three cities. This results in me gaining three food, one from this settler to this city, one from the settler on the ship to this city, and the third from the ship to this city. A second settler on the ship would establish the maximum four trading routes. I should note that the food you're gaining is not coming from the owner of these cities. Your trade routes have no effect on the other player. You may never trace distance through an unrevealed region or any sea spaces adjacent to a pirate. After the third round of turns, an age ends and the players enter the status phase. This consists of six steps. Step one, complete objectives. If any player has completed the requirements listed on one or more of their objective cards, they reveal them now. Step two, receive a free advancement. Each player, starting with the starting player, chooses one advancement to learn at no cost. The usual rules for choosing an advancement must be followed. If gaining the new advancement triggers an event, it is resolved before the next player chooses their advancement. Step 3. Draw cards. Each player now gains an additional objective and action card. Step 4 is to raise a city. Each player, starting with the starting player, may now destroy one of their own size 1 cities, if they choose. In doing so, they gain one gold. A player may do this if the city is blocking a bigger city from collecting resources, or if the owner thinks it's in military danger and doesn't feel he can defend it. Determining first player is done by adding together the positions of all indicators. The highest result gets to choose who becomes first player. For example, blue has 4, 1, and 3. Red has 5, 2, and 3. Red would receive the choice of who goes first. If there is a tie for highest, and the current first player is part of this tie, he remains the first player. If the current first player isn't part of the tie, 
the next player to his left part of the tie gets to choose the next first player. And finally, a new leader may rise. If your leader was defeated during the last age, or you feel it's time for a change of leadership, this is the time a new leader can be promoted. If you have a leader currently in play, remove him from the board and remove the current leader card from the game. If you just remove your leader, or he died during the previous age, flip the next leader card, and after reading the privileges he provides, pick any city to start him in. If the removed or defeated leader was your third one, then no leader will be promoted, and you go the remainder of the game without one. Move the turn marker to turn one of the next age, and the first player starts his turn. If this was the status page of age six, the game ends after the complete objectives step. I must note that the game may immediately end if one player has no cities remaining left on the map. At the end of the game, victory points are counted, and a winner is found. Each city piece in your color counts as one victory point. Remember, this includes city pieces in enemy cities that are under your cultural influence. Each advancement learned is worth one half victory point. Remember to include your learned special advancements on your civilization board. Next, each city with a wonder gains five victory points to the owner of the city. After that, count up completed objectives. Each objective completed grants two victory points to their owner. Lastly, you may have earned special victory points. These come from killing enemy leaders, events, or points unique to your civilization due to a leader or an advancement. The player with the most victory points is the winner. In case of ties, the player who built the Great Pyramid Wonder is the winner. If not built, the player with the most city pieces is the winner. If still tied, the player with the most advancements is the winner. Further ties are broken by the number of wonders, then by the number of completed objectives. If players are still tied after all that, they share the victory. It's time to fight. We've gone this far peacefully, but all great civilizations have to deal with military aggression at one point or another. Let's take a look at how combat works in Clash of Cultures. When army units enter a space with an enemy army, a battle occurs. Each unit provides one die to the combat value. A player divides their combat value by five to determine how many hits were delivered. Each hit defeats one army unit. Both sides remove units simultaneously. If both armies have units left, the attacker may decide to fight another round. The attacker may instead decide to cease the attack, withdraw his units back to the space they attacked from. If both sides lose their army, there is no winner or loser. Any settlers or leaders are defeated as well. The bottom portion of all action cards provide bonuses in combat. Before any round of combat, players that have learned tactics may play one of their cards. The attacker must declare if he's using an action card first. The defender, if he has tactics, can then decide if they will do the same. Before any dice are rolled, both cards are revealed and executed. Then, after any effects are applied, the battle resolves. Both action cards are discarded after the round of battle. If a leader is with an army, they may provide bonuses to a battle. Check the leader card for any details on this. Be careful though. If a leader is defeated, the enemy takes the defeated leader card giving them two victory points at the end of the game. Cavalry and elephant units can also change the tides of battle. Cavalry adds one to the combat value for each infantry unit in the army. An army of one cavalry and three infantry would result in a plus three to the dice roll. An army of two cavalry and two infantry is a plus four, plus two for each cavalry unit. Elephants may provide defense. For each elephant in an army, a die resulting in a 1 or a 2 no longer adds to the combat value. Instead, they block a hit. This army of 3 has an elephant. A roll of a 6, 6, and 1 would cause the 6 and 6 to make a combat value of 12 and the 1 to become a block. When armies with mounted units receive hits, 
mounted units must be removed before infantry. If the defending army is located in a city, then the attack is said to be attacking the city. Combat is resolved as normal, but if the defending army is defeated, the attacking army captures the city. The attacker replaces all city pieces in the defender's color with the matching city pieces of their color. Any third party city pieces are not changed. If the captured city was happy or neutral, the defeated player receives refugees in forms of a settler in any of his other cities. The attacking player receives gold equal to the city size and the city becomes angry. If enemy ships share the same space, a naval battle occurs. Naval battles are resolved the same way as land battles, with each ship providing a die to the combat value. Land units on the ship do not affect naval battles, except for leaders. Some leaders in the game can provide bonuses in naval combat. Check the leader's card to see if that's the case. If a ship carrying land units is defeated, then the land units on that ship are defeated as well. As we've seen, the lower half of all action cards can add surprise tactics in combat to get the upper hand. The top half of action cards offer special actions that are not combat oriented, such as inspiration that allows you to learn an advancement known by an opponent for free, or leadership that allows you to take four actions instead of the usual three. The text in bold at the top tells the player when such card can be played. Once played and resolved, the action card is discarded, so any card used for the top half effect cannot be used for its combat effect later, and vice versa. Objective cards also have an upper and lower half. The upper half are focused on development actions, while the lower half is focused on military actions. This objective card is complete by either being happy and controlling four happy cities, or being a conqueror after capturing a player's defended city. The text in bold tells the player when they can play the objective card. Most will be during the status phase. Some can come out immediately after the terms have been satisfied. The construction of a wonder is a signature of greatness. Building a wonder is five victory points and provide other benefits depending on the wonder. If a player learns engineering, they reveal the top card of the wonder deck and place it near the map. Revealed wonders can be built by any player. To build a wonder, a player must have learned the advancements listed on the wonder card, collected the 11 resources required, and accumulated five culture tokens. Throughout the game, you will see this AAA. This means as an action. These are actions you can take beyond the six we've covered in this video. To build a wonder, you take the special action listed on engineering. Once built, the wonder piece is placed in the city and the wonder card is placed near the player's board. Any powers listed on the card are now in effect. Make sure to defend the wonder heavily. For if a city with a wonder is captured by another player, they gain control of the wonder and the victory points it yields. I've mentioned events several times. Let's take a look at these in more detail. With an event being resolved every third, fifth, or seventh space on the scale, a single player may resolve up to six events in a game. If there is an icon showing in the upper right, this is resolved first. There are five possible icons, and they only affect the player triggering the event. This one is gold mined. It means that your civilization has come across some good luck and immediately gains two gold. This symbol means exhausted. The player is required to place this X token on an empty non-barren land space adjacent to one of his cities. This space can no longer be collected from or have cities founded on it. The barbarian symbol with a plus sign means to spawn barbarians. This requires a player to spawn a new barbarian settlement within two of one of his cities. Settlements may never be on sea, barren, or exhausted spaces. This new settlement will come with one infantry unit. After the settlement is placed, the player must then add one more barbarian army unit to any barbarian settlement existing on the board, which may include the one you just placed. If a settlement already has at least one infantry unit, the player is free to add a cavalry or elephant instead of an infantry. This barbarian symbol with a sword means the barbarians attack. Find all barbarian settlements within two spaces of your cities. 
Of these, the settlement with the most barbarian units attack the closest of your cities. Any ties are decided by the active player. When barbarians attack, all units move into the city regardless of terrain or other units between them and the target city. A barbarian attack only lasts one round, and their dice are rolled by another player. Barbarians never use action cards, but you are free to use action cards in your defense. Hits you roll remove barbarian army units as usual. Each hit barbarians produce are applied to any figures in the city. This can be army, settler, or even leader figures. If all your figures have been removed and there are still hits to apply, each hit reduces the size of the city by removing city pieces. If the city ever drops below size 1, then it is destroyed. If your city was reduced in size but not destroyed, it becomes angry. After the round of battle, surviving barbarians return to their settlement. The final event icon is this pirate's flag, activating the pirates to raid. Look for all pirates that are within two of your coastal cities. Coastal cities are those that are adjacent to sea spaces. I've labeled them with color. For each pirate ship that can be paired up with a unique coastal city, you are raided of one resource or one mood token. For each resource or mood token you are unable to pay, an affected coastal city must be reduced in mood. After the raid, the player spawns a new pirate ship onto any sea space on the board. This cannot be a space with a player ship, but it may be added to other pirate ships. If all four pirate ships are already on the board, the player removes any one of them and spawns it where they choose. If the event card has two icons, resolve the top icon first and then the bottom. After the event card has been resolved, read aloud the text and resolve any action it asks you to perform. Some text will only refer to you doing something. This refers only to the player who triggered the event. Other cards will refer to all players doing something. Some events are placed near the map and the first player to fulfill its request may reap the benefits of them. This great artist has entered the world. The first player to pay one culture token gets a free cultural advance and can make a city happy. Barbarian and pirates may be attacked. Another player rolls for them, but they cannot play action cards. You are free to use action cards as you see fit. If you enter a space with a barbarian settlement and there are no units, or you defeat them all. You will receive one gold for each barbarian unit you defeated and now have to choose. You may raise the city, removing it from the board and gain one additional gold. Or keep the city, replace the settlement with one of your own and make it angry. Pirates don't only raid cities. They also block the collection of resources and trade routes from being established in their space in all adjacent sea spaces. Naval battle with pirates are resolved as one would with a player. Another player rolls for the pirates, and you may use action cards, but the pirates may not. For each pirate ship defeated, you receive one gold and one mood token. Trading between players and diplomacy is allowed. The game allows the trading of resources, the culture or mood tokens, and even the action and objective cards. Peace treaties and other arrangements may be formed as well, but at your own risk. A player's betrayal of such treaties are not enforced through the game. And with that covered, there's only one more thing to go over. The effects of the city pieces in your city. Let's end with this. This is the port. It may be built in any city with at least one adjacent sea space after learning fishing. With a port, ships may be built in the sea space the port extends into. And when collecting, the sea space provides food, gold, or a mood token. The academy. It may be built after the learning of writing. When an academy is built, the player immediately gains two ideas. Remember, ideas can replace food when learning a new advancement. The fortress may be built after the learning of tactics. 
the fortress provides military protection for the city in the opening round of combat by providing two bonuses. First, it provides an additional combat die. Second, it provides one block, absorbing one hit achieved by the attacker. The temple may be built in a city after learning mist. When built, you gain one culture token or one move token. Remember, you can't have more than your indicators allow. The market. It may be built in a city after learning bartering. The market allows a city to build cavalry and elephant units. Cities without markets can only build infantry. Also, when another player forms a trade route with any one of your cities with a market, you gain one gold. The obelisk is available after arts and structures. The obelisk can never change ownership. It cannot be targeted by cultural influence. And if a city of yours is captured, this city piece remains in your color. Finally, the apothecary. It may be built after the city learns mathematics. The apothecary allows you to recover land units lost in combat or to an event. After the battle or event is fully resolved, you can pay one food for each city with an apothecary and return a unit to each of those cities. And with these rules, you've got enough to play Clash of Cultures Civilization. What I haven't covered is how each advancement on the player board or the civilization boards work, but you are free to play and discover those on your own. There are also variants provided in the rules that allow you for variant endings or the shorter four age game. If you have any questions, please post them in the comments below and I'll address them as soon as I can. Enjoy your game. Thank you.